Ephesians chapter 4, please. Ephesians chapter 4. Um, tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, we're going we're to read uh, down through verse, oh, let's see here. Through verse 10. Yeah, I'm going to read down through verse 10. And then I'm going to ask you some questions. And hopefully during the course of tonight, um, you will be able to answer these questions if you're not already able to answer the questions. All right? And um, they're sort of like Bible trivia questions. What did happen here? Or what is this? So on and so on. All right? Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, we mentioned that last uh, Sunday night, Paul always talks about him being the prisoner of Jesus Christ, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now that's a bond that nobody complains about. Being blessed and bound, bonded in with people of peace. People who have a spirit of peace and have the gift of peace in them. Uh, there are some people that are peacemakers. They are. They are peacemakers. Um... I like to be uh, when it when I you know find out that some people aren't getting along, especially people in my own family or whatever. I like to be a peacemaker. I want everybody to get along. Now, when it comes to substantive issues, um, like I don't know, calling God a liar, uh, when it comes to certain Bible topics that the Bible I think is very clear on. Um, when somebody um, will call or whatever and, and they want to argue with me. They want me to debate that. I've even had somebody, believe it or not, um, and in all the years I've been doing this, I, I'm, I, be, I believe it. I, I, it struck me at first, but anyway, uh, I started dealing with this issue of this, the so-called dispensations where there was a different gospel at different times and Peter's gospel is different than Paul's gospel and all this stuff. And um, I found some people in our online group, the, the official Bethel Church group that were uh, that had put themselves in that group to monitor, I guess, me and to monitor the group. And then if they saw signs that uh, that we weren't dispensationalists. They were going to correct everybody. And they had started introducing that stuff. And I put them out. I knew exactly what they were doing. I knew the danger of it. And I put them, I put them out. But I had one guy that I was, I was dealing with it on Pastor Mike Online. He sent me an email to prove how wrong I was. And it made no sense whatsoever. And then he said, I'm challenging you to have me come to your church to sit next to you in your in your podcast place and debate you online live in front of all your people. He said, I guarantee you I'll win. And he said, there, you're challenged. And he said, now I'm expecting you to call me and tell me when I'm supposed to. I mean, he was like, and I'm going, well, you're a different kind of idiot. If you really think that I'm going to pay for your expenses. That's what he was, that's what he was getting at. I'm going to pay for your expenses. Have you flown in here from who knows where? Give you a seat next to me only so that you can take over my podcast and don't let me talk because I know how some people debate. They don't let anybody else get another word in edgewise. They don't want to hear the opposite or the alternative view. All they want to do is dominate and, and take over people and call them names. And then that way they're justified in what they believe. They're right because, um, because they're smart. And uh, I'm like, no, I don't think so. 
I, don't, I never even really considered it. But that's what he wanted. He wanted, to, he wanted to take control of everything. And then he wanted me to use my stuff that we paid for and the time that we uh, broadcast on and everything like that just so he could prove me wrong. And it's like, you know, if you think you can prove me wrong, then you get you a camera and a microphone and you make your own videos. And then if people follow you, people follow you. If people follow me, they follow me. And um, boy, I tell you what, some people. Anyway, um, where was I going with that? I don't remember what I was saying. Um, where did I stop reading? That's the, that's the thing right there. The bond of peace. There we go. Um, to those who want to argue, to those who want to fight, uh, I would just rather be with people that I can be at peace with. Amen? And that's what I like. Uh, there is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. If I do that, that's what we looked at last, uh, that last Sunday. There's seven ones here. One is seven and seven is one. It's kind of like three is one and one is three. There is one body and one spirit. That's two, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in y'all. They just didn't put the parentheses in there, but it's y'all, in y'all. Um, seven, seven things here matching the seven spirits of God and so on. In verse seven, uh, but unto everyone, and, and this is what I want you to pay attention to, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure uh, of the gift of Christ. And I want you to think about that. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So, uh, let me ask you this question. And if you have the answer, fine. If you don't have the answer, fine. We'll learn it. But question number one, let's see, what can I make question number one? Question number one. Before Christ came, where did people go, their souls, where did the souls of people go uh, who died before Jesus Christ went to the cross? Okay, two people know. What about the rest of y'all? Anybody know? Where they went? No, don't, don't say yet. Do you know? Yeah. Not that. Follow the rules, remember. Okay. Um, so we have three people that say they know. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Not bad. Um. Is that where all of them went? Second question. Number three. Um, where did Jesus spend the three days after he died on the cross? Where did his body go and where did his soul go? And did they go to the same place? Okay. That's another question. Um, number four, I guess. What gifts did he give to men? That's what it says here. Okay. Uh, number five. Who is it mentioning... When it says he led captivity captive. Okay. What is it? What is it? Who is it referring to in that statement? That is in um, verse eight. 
All right. Now, let's start with. Uh, let's see here. What is that going to end up being? That's going to end up being. Uh, let's see the question number four, I think. Verse seven, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And let me read verse eight. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. What are the gifts that Christ gave to men? Who can answer that? Huh? The gifts of the Spirit. Okay, I'm asking, what are those gifts specifically? You have to be specific. Yes. Okay. Um, anything else? JR? Gr uh, grace. Okay, yeah. He's given grace. That's pretty good. Anything else? Huh? That's that's one of the gifts. That's that's kind of what I'm looking for. Uh, all right, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, let me let's see here. Let me see where I'm going with this. Okay, where? Um, and let's see here. Okay, uh, maybe this would be another question. That I could ask you, but look at verse seven again. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, I've said this before, so it shouldn't be a difficult question to answer. Does God forgive some people more than he forgives other people? Does God forgive some people more than? Then he forgives other people. Now I've seen head shake yes and head shake no. So maybe I should split the church. All the head shake yes over here and all the head shakes no over here. Okay? No, I won't do that. I've had enough of splitting the church. But anyway, what is the answer to that? Does God forgive some people more than he forgives others? Turn to Luke 7. It's a relatively easy question if you think about it. What if some people never ask for forgiveness? How many times does God forgive them? Zero. If you don't ask. I mean, what did Jesus say? Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Okay. Uh, John, you don't count for any of these questions because you have the like pure Bible search software in front of you. So. All right. Luke 7, verse 44. This is um, if we get the context of this. Um, oh, look at verse 40. You know what? I should have put that in the notes here. Jesus answered and he said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. Verse 41, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. So at this, ask the question, if someone has, owes 500 and someone owes 50, if neither one of them have the ability to pay, are they not even as far as uh, forgiveness and unforgiveness is concerned. They are even in that both of them, neither one of them can pay it back. So all of them get put into the category of debts uncollected. Okay? Debts uncollected. You owe a debt and you can't pay it back. So what difference does it make? Is there a, is there a separate law? I know there's bankruptcy laws. Is there a separate bankruptcy law for somebody who owes more than somebody else? Sounds like to me that it's the same law. doesn't matter how much you owe. Now, I know there's probably little 
divisions like, um, um, you know, chapter 11 bankruptcy, chapter 13 bank. I don't know what all the differences are. Uh, some of them involve corporations, some involve private people. I don't know. But anyway, I've never filed. So, um, but anyway, if you leave debts unpaid and you owe $5,000 and your neighbor owes $50,000, you're still, you're in the same category. Debts unpaid. That's how God sees it. A lot of people, I'll say this, the Catholic Church, I think is one of them. They categorize sin. They have venial sins and they have, um, what's the other one? Mortal sins. Venial sin and mortal sins can only be forgiven by, what, by the Pope or something like that or by a cardinal or anyway. Uh, a venial sin can be forgiven by any priest. They categorize sins and thus they categorize sinners. And they like to say, well, he's more holy than she is. But if they're both unclean, they're both unclean. If somebody wakes up one day and they find that they've got leprosy on this pinky. And yet somebody has leprosy on the whole right side of their body. They're both in the same predicament as far as the law is concerned. The law does not see them any different. They have leprosy. They're both unclean. They're both to proclaim that as they walk through the streets. Unclean, unclean, unclean. Why? So it's not to uh, infect anybody else. So here we have in that parable, um, they're in the same boat. Verse 42, and when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. The phrase forgave most is your key. Does God forgive some people more than others? Yes. And it has to do with the number of sins that they committed. Uh, it's not that it's a contest. Oh, I want God to love me more, so I'm going to go sin more. I wouldn't recommend that as a plan for God's love. Um, the less you are able to sin, the less sin baggage you're going to carry around later on in life. Amen. Sin, young people, when adults try to, it doesn't matter if they're parents or if they're just older people uh, or me as your pastor, when I'm telling you, Stay away from certain things and don't ever get caught up in it. Um, trust me and trust us. There's a lot of things that when you get later on in life, you wish you'd never done. Okay, you wish you had never done. Uh, and you don't want a life filled with regrets that way. So now uh, if we pick it up in verse 43 and then 44 Simon answered and said I suppose that he to whom he forgave most and he said unto him thou hast rightly judged He turned to the woman and said unto Simon seest thou this woman I entered into thine house Thou gavest me no water for my feet But she hath washed my feet with tears And wiped them with the hairs of her head Thou gavest me no kiss But this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet my head with oil, thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. So we go back to Ephesians 4, 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, um, I, have, I have been here doing what I'm doing tonight um, since... November of 1996. I mean, I was here a couple years before that as associate pastor, but as the role of pastor since um, late November, mid-November of 1996, December 1996, 
and ever since that time gone forward. So 96, 2006, 10 years, 2016, 20 years, uh, 2026 would be 30 years, minus three would be 27 years. And I have, I have labored, I've worked, I've tried to build the congregation up, um, tried to get more people on Wednesday night, more people on Sunday night, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, just not been able to do it. Just not been able to do it. Some pastors pastor all their life and all their ministry, and they generally only get a small church. Some pastors, it just seems like for some reason, they can take a church. Uh, the, the preacher that I grew up under, Preacher Golf, uh, he took this church when it was in pretty bad shape. And he started inviting people, started uh, different things. And I mean, at one point, at one point, we had almost 130 here for Sunday morning service. I mean, the, and he's the one that that room up there was a nursery. He's the one that had it tore out and made a balcony out of it. We had risers up there and pews up there because he figured that we were just going to keep on growing. And so he was going to start stacking people up there. Well, that never happened. And um, he finally uh, resigned after his, the, the attendance started going down a little bit. And he resigned and went to his old church down in Park Hills. Uh, but anyway, um, he probably is, as far as the people locally here, he's probably done better than any pastor I've ever seen do here. Um, I just never been able to match it. I don't know why. Uh, but I do understand that now we are in a different situation and we have the people, they're just not here locally. They're there, they're watching right now and they're going to watch later on this week. And I know that. And so in a way, God has given me a different measure of grace and he's, as far as my ministry is concerned and he's given uh, me just a completely different type of ministry and a type, I, I would say, grace or whatever. Grace is grace. And it's totally unearned on my part. It, this is what God said, I'm, Mike, I'm going to do this for you. And so I've, I've just come to the conclusion that in my lifetime or my service here, whenever that's going to end, I don't know when, I'm not looking forward to, but anyway, uh, I may never just pack the pews and have to throw up, tear down the walls and put in a bunch more. I, that may never happen. Uh, but I know that God is still working and God is still using us and, and we have people, they're all over the place, all right? Uh, you know, and so while some church tonight on a Sunday night may have two or 300 people there, uh, I've got two or 300 people, they're just not here. Okay, but they're out there watching. And so keep in mind, people, and this is this will help you when it comes where we want to start judging other people. There's some people who just need more patience, forbearance, long suffering, grace. Mercy, forgiveness, there are just some people, and there will always be that way. Jesus said this, to, uh, what he was, uh, this doesn't have anything to do uh, with kind of what I'm saying, but he made this statement, the poor you have with you always. Meaning that in spite the efforts of churches all over the world, there are still people starving to death and dying, and they're going to die in poverty. Okay? And that's always going to be. It's always going to be that when God decides to bless the vine or God, when God blesses uh, whatever seed is sown, that some are going to bring forth 30, some 60 and some 100. That's just how it's going to be. Some churches are going to be small. Some are going to be medium. Some are going to be big. It's just how it is. And I have learned that whatever grace God gives me and whatever measure, whatever ministry God gives me, I'm going to accept that. Is it wrong to pray for more? No. But God may just give me something better. And he has, as far as I'm concerned. I don't have to deal with 300 different people on Sunday night. Okay? Love y'all. All right. Anyway. So when it comes to dealing with people in the church, other people, 
There, there's always going to be people who may be down at the altar more. There's always going to be people who seem like that just sin, just their own sin just really bothers them all the time. And they're constantly praying, God, forgive me, God, forgive me, God, forgive me. Well, then some are saying, man, what, what is their problem? They must have me cut out right or something. I don't know. Anyway, so uh, turn to Ephesians chapter four. Oh, we're already there. Verse eight, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. What are those gifts? Now that he ascended, what is it also? He's descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up, up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, I have in my notes here, Galatians 5. But, and I don't know if it's a big deal, but the things listed in, in Galatians 5 are not listed as the gifts of the Spirit. They're listed as the fruit of the Spirit. Here is... Um, Let's see here. All right, I got my notes jumbled up. We're going to deal with where he descended to. That's what we're going to deal with next. Now, what was the, what was the answer? The first question. The first question I ask is, where did people go who died before Calvary? Who died before Golgotha? Died before Christ went to the cross? Where did they go? You know, they go to the movies? Yes. Yeah, we already covered that. What's, what's your answer? Abraham's bosom. Now that's only part of the answer. What's the other part of the answer? JR? Huh? No, they all, everybody that died before Calvary, some of them went to Abraham's bosom. Where did the rest of them go? Mars, the sun, where did they go? I'm going to let somebody else handle this one. Where did they go? No. Hell, there you go. Okay. Two places. Um, Matthew 12, 39, he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There should be no sign given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, the center of the earth. Uh, I, I explained something while I was in Indiana that I'm a geocentrist, and I said, I believe what I'm saying by that in that I believe that the earth because the question came up, you know, do I believe that other civilizations exist on other planets and God has like a salvation for them? I don't know. Actually, C.S. Lewis wrote about that. He had a whole series of books called the Space Trilogy, and he had people living on Mars that uh, had to have a, uh, Christ come to them. And then he dealt with uh, a, a couple living on the planet Venus that was like Adam and Eve of Venus. And God had given them a law that they were not supposed to break. And C.S. Lewis's character had to go to Venus to help them not break God's law. And so in, at Venus, the couple, Adam and Eve, that lived on Venus, they succeeded in not breaking God's commandments. So they had a, a sinless world that they lived in. And I'm going, yeah, but it's awfully hot there. Um, and so I, at the t when I read this when I was in like in high school and college, I thought, oh, well, that's neat. When I look back on it now and I'm going, no, he's way off. Totally way off. Um, and so anyway, I believe that the focus of the entirety of the universe is what goes on right here on planet Earth. And I say that because the very place that God designated to be the place of eternal destruction for the devil and his angels was put in the heart of this particular world right here, earth, called hell. He answered and said unto them, at, uh, verse 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, 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 
shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Look what he's saying. That God, when he resurrects the saved, those who repented, he's going to resurrect the people of Nineveh they are going to rise in judgment against this generation and say, you guys blew it. You guys blew it. And by the way, Jonah gave testimony to that in Jonah chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. And he said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou hearest my voice. So Jonah's given testimony to Jesus being in hell or in the heart of the earth. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. Did Jesus suffer in the flames of hell for three days and three nights? Did Jesus suffer in the flames of hell? Anybody say yes? The Bible says nothing about it. Kenneth Copeland does. Joyce Myers does. All of these um, charismatic word faith people, that's what they believe. They believe that Jesus had to go through and suffer the, f the flames of hell itself in order to truly and rightly pay for our transgressions. That's a lie. A lie, lie, lie. I said you have to be quiet. No, I'm just kidding, John. That's a lie. That's a big lie. Not even true. Okay, um, so when Christ went down to that place, so what was he doing for three days? There you go. First Peter four, where do you think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick, quick means alive and the dead, dead means dead. Notice that he's judging those who are alive and those who are dead. Those who are alive are in Abraham's bosom or were in Abraham's bosom. Those who are dead were in hell. It's a different kind of death. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. That they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And then in 1 Peter chapter 3. Christ also had once suffered for sins. That does not mean he suffered in hell. He suffered on the cross. The just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, made alive by the spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So... Uh, you might want to make a note that in your Bible and underline the word prison because there's a story in the Bible that is one of those stories that gives you an idea or an indication of the nature and character of the Antichrist. And that person's name is Barabbas. When Pilate was going to give everybody their choice, he took Jesus, whom they all hated, and then he went criminal that he could find and brought him out. It, it would be like the only person I can think of is Charles Manson. Maybe some of you guys don't know, remember who Charles Manson was. But he led his cult group to slaughter and kill uh, some Hollywood people. One was a, was a famous actress at the time, Sharon Tate. And um, um, they actually, the people that he sent there to murder them, they actually took their blood and used it to write things on the wall of that house. It was a, just a gory, gory crime scene. It was very bad. And so Charles Manson went and... They threw him in prison and threw away the key. California had eliminated their death penalty. Isn't that nice? So they let Charles Manson sit in jail and rot in jail for all of his life. And now he's dead. So now he's in a different prison now. 
But anyway, um, it would be like if the governor of California went out to get um, Charles Manson and stood him up there. You have Charles Manson here, you have Jesus Christ here, and ask the people of California, oh my goodness, ask the people of California, who would they choose? Should I release Charles Manson or should I release Jesus Christ? Sadly to say, probably California would say, oh, give us Marilyn Manson or Charles or whoever he is. Um, but anyway, that's what they did. And the Bible says that they brought him up out of prison. So Barabbas is a picture of the Antichrist. He's brought up out, of the, the Antichrist rises up out of the pit. He comes up out of the sea. He comes up out of the prison. All three of those apply to the same place. Verse 20, which were sometime disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein that is eight souls were saved by water. So uh, these two verses clearly tell us that Christ went to preach to the gospel to the dead, preach to spirits in prison. And so he's telling the people in Abraham's bosom uh, you guys did right, you believed in God, you trusted in God, you follow God by faith, so therefore there's laid up for you the joys of heaven. And then he tells those who are in hell, you blew it, you should have trusted in God, you should have trusted in the Lord, you should have trusted um, uh, in your creator, but you didn't do that. Uh, you didn't trust, you trusted in your own gods, or you followed other gods, or you worshiped idols. Or you were just wicked and so you're dead now and uh, you're going to stay here a little while longer and you're going to roast for a while. We're going to bring you out and give you a brand new body and then God's going to judge you. And that's what's going to happen to them. So now, are we at to the gifts part? Yes, finally, Ephesians 4. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So turn to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. This is where it mentions specifically and calls them gifts. Gifts of the Spirit or gifts in general. But you're right, there are other gifts. Grace is a gift. Uh, Jesus Christ himself is our gift. The Word of God is a gift to us. We've not done anything to earn it. Um... So verse 27, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Uh, if I were to apply this idea of God gives the measure of grace differently to different people, what he's doing is he's given things that they need as members of the body. Now, um, there are parts of my body that need a lot more blood than others. So let's say my hand um, doesn't require as much blood to it as my face does. God designed the face to be just full of blood. Doesn't matter uh, if you've watched MMA boxing or just boxing in general. When somebody punches somebody in the face and rips that skin, I mean blood just oozes everywhere. It's our blood gives our face color. And so there are, I would want the majority of the oxygen in my body going to my brain cells. And in a situation, some of you know this, in a situation where the body has received extreme trauma, what does the body automatically do? Start shutting down parts of the body and reserving blood flow and oxygen for the vital organs in the brain does it automatically okay you don't have to flip a switch on you don't have to look up the manual to find the code for it or nothing it's an automatic thing i i've noticed um i i noticed this when i baptized a guy one time in in late october okay kind of like it is now um imagine Walking into the big river right now. Okay? It's cold. And I baptized him. It was 80 degrees that Sunday afternoon. He wanted to be baptized. So we went to the big river. 
And we walked into that water, and I noticed as that water was rising up, I was breathing funny. I was like going, whoo, it was automatic. You know what my body was doing? It was preparing itself for the eventuality that I may be under the water and in that cold. There's actually senses on our nose that when they hit cold water, it kicks in this thing where we want to breathe heavily and it starts diverting oxygen to the brain because the brain's at risk. One of the things that they've noticed about like people falling into frozen lakes and ponds is that generally, even if they're underwater, they tend to survive longer than people who just drown in warm water. And the reason being is the cold water affects their body and it shuts almost everything down except the vital areas and the brain. And it reserves as much oxygen as possible for the brain so that even six, seven, eight minutes of them not breathing, some cases even a little bit longer, especially if a child, they're able to pull them out and resuscitate them and they live a normal life because God built that into their body, okay? So, as a practical issue, in a church body, in a family body, we should always want those who need the most to get the most. I didn't say want. I didn't say desire. Need. The most. We should always want those who need the most to get the most. Amen? Okay, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Next time we have to deal with somebody, next time uh, we think about Kenya or whatever. Okay, they, we, like I said, we throw away things here that we take for granted. That they would give anything to have. But they don't have anything. I've been to their houses. I'm telling you, they don't have anything. It's sad. Now, you're the body of Christ and members in particular. God has set some in the church. First apostles. Now, he only called the original 12 minus uh, Judas Iscariot. Adding Matthias. And then the Apostle Paul. Okay? So, that's the only group of apostles. There are no apostolic ministries now that are recognized by God. I, uh, the Pope believes that, that he is the recipient of apostolic succession. He believes that he is receiving the chair of Peter, St. Peter, who was the Bishop of Rome... And so he believes that the, apost the apostleship office that was on Peter has descended now down to him. And that's what gives him the right to dictate to the church what he wants them to believe and what he wants them to have. But first the apostles. Then you have the prophets, which are the preachers. Then teachers. And it takes a gift to teach adequately it takes a gift i've had in my life really good uh, school teachers really good sunday school teachers and i've had some sunday school teachers that were eh. and a lot of it had to do or i will will say in in the case of one man in particular and i love this man don't get me wrong but he wasn't very well educated and he couldn't read very well and he really wasn't much of one to speak in front of a group. It just wasn't his, wasn't his gift. Uh, but he did it out of, I think, out of necessity. The church needed somebody back then. This is talking about when I was growing up. Um, but anyway, he, he wasn't the best that I have in my memory. I've had others that were way better. But it, it's a gift that God gives to people, okay? Um, Teachers after that miracles Okay, and listen God is a miracle God Don't take that away from and don't let the charismatics take that away from us either This is a legitimate gift that God gives to people gifts of healings Gifts of helps and I like this there are people 
who will want to brag and boast about they have the gift of healing, they will completely overlook what I think is a much more needed gift, and that is a gift of helps. Part of what I do is a helps type ministry. I want to help people understand the Bible. I want to help people believe the Bible. And I want to give them as much of the things that God has given me to share with them to help them when they read the Bible to number one, find it interesting. To number two, to want to continue to read more and more and more. So it uh, helps in that way. I will tell you this. I lack in the gift of governments. I'm a lousy boss. I'm not a good administrator. Um, I got the IRS in the state of Kentucky after me because they think we sold stuff at MUFON. And they sent me a form saying, this is your last notice. You better put down here how much you sold. <laughs> so I wrote them an email back yesterday morning and I said, we're a church. We gave everything away. We didn't sell anything. So I got I to gotta fill out this stupid form now and put zeros on all the boxes because that's what we got. We got zero. Okay. But, he, but I'm just, they said it's the second notice. I don't, I didn't see the first one. Okay. A good administrator would have seen it. I didn't. So I'm not very good at governments. Um, and there are diversities of tongues. There are people who can speak. Uh, somebody asked Pastor Lordson how many languages he spoke. He said, hmm, seven. I'm like, English is fine. Uh, I would like to learn other languages. I don't know that I would be able to. Um, so governments, diversities, and you'll notice that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm missing one here. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings, helps, Governments, tongues, that's eight. I thought there was nine. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? No. And here we go to our Pentecostal friends, do all speak with tongues? The answer is no. Do all interpret? No. There are those who teach and those who learn. It takes both. But covet earnestly the best gifts. And I will tell you, tongues is not that one. But that's the gift that gets people recognized and noticed. Because if you're, if you're up there blabbering in this unknown stuff, and nobody knows what you're saying. More than likely, what you're doing is putting on a spiritual show for people. Look at me. I can do this. Therefore, God is in me a lot. And he's not in you a lot because you're not up here doing what I'm doing. And that's what it turns into. When I'm, I'm telling you, God was right when he said that we're not saved by works because men would boast. And when it comes to tongues, I've ever talked to about the issue of tongues, they boast on their tongues. They boast against us and they say, well, you guys aren't even right with God. You don't speak in tongues. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. Covet earn the best gifts and yet I show you a more excellent way. In that, in that next chapter, he's going to talk about charity. And then Romans 12, verse 3, and then we'll... In with this. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man in the measure of faith. Now he's talking about measuring again. Grace is given by measure. Faith is given by measure. The gifts, I believe, are given by measure. Okay? And I, I don't believe that, uh, that like when it comes to like 
all, let's say, miracles and healings and helps and tongues and things like that, I don't think that a person has just one gift per their lifetime and they say, well, he's got the gift of healing, but he's got the gift of tongues. I think that when the situation arises and you need help, I think the Holy Ghost kicks in and gives you the help you need. It doesn't do any good to speak in tongues to someone who needs an interpretation. Doesn't do any good. Well, that's my gift. Well, you need a different one. Okay, because we don't need the tongue. We're already confused. We need an interpreter. So, same way here, the measure of faith. For as many as have, uh, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace. There it is. The gifts are different because the grace is given by measure and is different with other people. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy. According to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. And that was something that my wife will tell you I struggled with. I wanted... Nothing more than after we got married for me to get a church for me to pastor. God didn't do that. He had me go out and learn how to support a family first. Then he gave me a church. But he didn't give me a full-time one. He gave me a part-time one. So I still had to work. But that was God's plan. He, I wasn't ready. God wasn't ready to use me. So it wasn't until... Like I say, 1996, that I stepped into this. And at the time, I didn't want it. But that's a different story. But anyway, um, God was saying, Mike, you're close to being ready. And uh, you go ahead and set foot in that office. And then I'm going to take care of the rest. And boy, he did. And I'll never forget that. But anyway, uh, I had to wait on that ministry. And anybody tells you, that, well, you, God's waiting on you. God's waiting on you to take a leap of faith. You need to step forward first and then... No, that's not what God said. God said, wait. God said, wait. You want to minister? Then wait on it. It'll be worth it. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. All of these are different gifts. So how many are here? We have prophecy, uh, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, ruling, showing mercy. Seven. Did I count it right? Seven there. And then Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit will manifest the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There's none. So consider these things... Um, Back in Ephesians, um, he gave, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. Um, Help me to remember that I want to deal with he led captivity captive and kind of discuss that a little bit of what he means by that. Okay. What was he referring to? Let's stand to our feet.